。好，各位线上听众，大家好。很高兴又来到了每月一度的盖亚科普讲座，我是主持人，中央大学网络学习科技研究所施如林。今天的主题跟我们所熟悉的 SDGs 联合国永续发展目标有关，会谈到环境科学与灾害评估。因此，我们今天邀请到的专家是来自于宁波诺丁汉大学地理科学系的副教授唐玉婷博士。唐教授早期在台大药学系生物化学研究所学习化学、药理学、分子生物学。他在大学期间就开始利用暑假在癌症研究中心工作，并且一直持续到研究所毕业之后。唐教授从细胞及基因材料的实验学习到实验设计的逻辑，后来在杜克大学接触到风险评估的概念。于是他就把它整合，应用到毒物测验当中，开始建立污染物循环模型，把人类暴露在环境灾害的风险进行量化的呈现。他的专长让他后来到美国俄亥俄一家环境顾问公司工作，对污染地进行人体健康风险的评估。他也协助俄亥俄环保局对中地再开发计划协助监管。审查，并且组织风险评估指南中的毒理学资料库。后来，唐教授也协助我们台湾环保局建立土壤与地下水污染的人体健康风险评估技术指南。今天我们的讲题要谈地球，但是是从生物地球呃化学、生物地球化学的角度来切入，看环境元素的循环，然后再从很实际的。废弃物管理的角度来谈循环经济，那现在我们就不浪费时间，让我们邀请唐教授来跟我们谈谈，我们应该如何跟自然环境来互动。来，欢迎唐教授。嗯，大家好，我是唐玉婷。那啊、嗯，我们就呃，谢谢施老师的这个介绍，那我就不用再自我介绍了，我们就可以直接开始今天的讲座。那等一下呢，主要的讲座内容我可能会用英文来。呃，英文来呈现。呃，可是，在那个后面的这个 Q&A 的时候，大家欢迎大家用中文跟我交流，这是没有问题的。OK， 那我现在就开始分享画面。So, um, good morning, everybody. And today, uh, in this Gaia lecture series, I'm going to um talk about the human environmental relationship. But from a biogeochemical cycle perspective, and、um, I'm trying, I tried to combine the the lecture contents that I gave to my undergraduate student, which is the part in in biogeochemistry, and then add、uh, link them to、uh, the work that I did、uh, with one of my PhD student on the waste management. Hopefully, this will work today. But my hope is that I will bring. And、everything to、uh, to the、uh, the different audience, so everybody can get something from from the lecture today. So what I'm going to、um, present today, the, the 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 sequence I'm going to present today is first we will look at the、uh, this ultimate question. Usually,、um, a geography student will be asked to answer is. Whether you think human is part of the environment, or where we can separate ourselves from it, and this is、um, quite closely linked to the ideas of sustainable development. And from there, I want to introduce this、uh, circular way of looking at the Earth, which is the ideas of、uh, biogeochemical cycles. I will emphasizing on carbon cycle and then the、um, hydrological cycle or water cycle as we know it. And human activities have impacted these cycles,、uh, that actually have the the、um, negative effect to our environment and our human society. And that's the first part of the talk today, related to biogeochemical cycle. And since we now identify the problem, then I want to、um, share some、um, study results with you on. On the ideas of how waste management may contribute to part of the mitig mitigation process of、uh, this disturbed、um, biogeochemical cycle, and that can link to this circular economy ideas at the end. And I would like to close the talk today with rethinking about the human environment relationship and how we we have been managing it. 
So when we think about human environmental relationship um, at the modern days, probably the most important ideas would be the sustainable development. We want to manage the environment to balance the environment, economy, economic activities and societies. This is a, quite a mainstream ideas and a lot of sustainability index was um, built based on trying to see whether the environmental aspect, society, societal aspect and econ economic aspect are balanced. But actually the interpretation of the sustainable development and the examinations of human environmental relationship are quite diverse in, in, in the academia. So we, we, we have, we have uh, mapped these ideas um, in this spectrum. Um, on the left-hand side, we say it's a more anthropocentric view, which means it's a more human-centered ideas. And this uh, three balancing, three element um, kind of view was towards this um, human-centered view. But we have another uh, end of the spectrum, which is ecocentric, that heavily emphasizing the importance of the environment. And the argument starts with that, actually, the economic activities cannot really uh, isolate itself from the society. So it's just part of the societal activities. And then, actually, human society cannot perform its functions um, if there, there is no environment. So people who are taking a more um, taking more emphasis on, on the environmental protection and the ecological preservation has argued that actually we should preserve, we should put prioritize preserving environment. And, and also the scholars take a step forward, say actually we, we human um, cannot be separated from the environment. All our activities, we need to um, get something from the environment and the, perhaps we also um, give something back to the environment. So it's a kind of like a blur, the boundary between the three elements is quite blurred. And I would argue that the scholar taking this kind of view, kind of moving from the old environment or the ecocentric um, view slightly back towards the, the center of the spectrum that we are talking about. And that is kind of like a philosophical um, starting point for, for the lecture today. And I want to then shift to a more um, physical or chemical views on our Earth now. So um, biogeochemistry is this uh, relatively new discipline that's established probably half century ago or slightly earlier. This, uh, this is a discipline to study the chemical, physical, geo, uh, geological and biological process all together and the interaction uh, between them because all this process together kind of tell, tells us how the, the earth operates, the uh, environmental, global environment has been processed. And previously, geochemistry has been um, studied by uh, for a very long time. It is the, the biogeochemistry uh, subject um, emphasizing on the importance or added importance of the biosphere into the discipline. So basically we are studying the cycles of the specific ke uh, chemical elements like carbon, nitrogen, or phosphorus. They flow in different um, parts of the earth. And when I say different parts, this includes the biosphere, the, the biological component on earth. And then we want to look at it um, in across the space and also in a chronological orders. And the tools that we uh, we use for this um, studying this biogeochemical cycle, one of the important uh, model is this pulse and flux model. Simply put it, it's the combination of the, the pool um, that uh, estimating the uh, amount of the element in different compartments on Earth. And we can roughly uh, divide the compartment of Earth into three pools, which is the gas phase atmosphere and uh, lithosphere or land, uh, the solid phase and ocean or water bodies, um, which 
um, the ocean is the biggest water bodies on Earth. We can also separate uh, into a more detail, separate the compartment into a more detail if we want to characterize a specific area regions um, in those big compartments. And then uh, we add the, uh, the arrows into this model, which depicting the flow in and out of each compartment and the exchange between them. So basically the, uh, the pools contain the mass of the element and the flux tell, tells you how fast the element move between the compartments. I'm going to use carbon cycle as an example to illustrate this. This is a picture that I, that I digested from an old textbook depicting a very brief view or the understanding of the um, carbon cycle um, before industrialization. In this case, in, in this, um, in this uh, situation, human disturbing to the environment is probably much, much less. And we can see that um, uh, the, the numbers in the in the pool, which is the amount of carbon element, and also the, the arrows in between the, those pools, which depicting the, the, uh, the speed and the, how uh, the element are being transported. Based on this, I can um, characterize the carbon cycles um, in this um, briefly. I can characterize the carbon cycle briefly. First, uh, the lithosphere or the solid phase is really the biggest pool of carbon. It's, it holds true even until today. And atmosphere actually contain the least carbon, but actually the, 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 uh, the center of the attention of us on carbon cycle and these days are probably um, on the atmosphere. And the, the, the balance between the, uh, the, the compartment between the uh, lithosphere and the atmosphere, the drive of the carbon flow are mo has mostly been biological and the photosynthesis fixed the carbon into, from the atmosphere back into the lithosphere, whereas the functions of respiration serve as the, uh, the, the flow to uh, convert the solid phase of carbon, the hydro hydrocarbon primarily, uh, or, or organic carbon primarily uh, back into the atmosphere. And the pre -industrial, in the pre-industrial uh, time, these two directions are more or less balanced. The uh, interaction between atmosphere and the hydrosphere is more or less um, or prim primarily um, uh, in chemical sense rather than a bio, uh, biological sense. It's a balance between the concentration of carbon dioxide um, in the atmosphere and, and, and the hydrosphere. And the picture here kind of depicting how the carbon dioxide can be balanced between the two. And it's also being affected by the water chemistries in, in the ocean water, the iron, and also the, the temperature of the water. This all um, affect how much uh, carbon dioxide can the water body accommodate um, of the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So this is the pre-industrial conditions, but the recent industrializations of, of human society has disturbed such balance. The uh, burning of the fossil fuel kind of creating a new pathway from the lithosphere, sending the, um, a huge amount of carbon dioxide into atmosphere. But this is not the only path, uh, pathway human created. Because of this uh, excessive uh, carbon dioxide that has been sent into the atmosphere, the balance between the atmosphere and hydrosphere are also being affected. And therefore, the, uh, some part of the uh, uh, carbon dioxide that has been uh, put into the atmosphere now are being pushed into the hydrosphere. So we can say that human impact after the industrialization did not only uh, send the carbon into the atmosphere, actually it also contributes to, uh, to the increase of carbonate in the ocean water, which might affect uh, the, the marine ecosystem. And this is just a more detailed views um, on the carbon cycle. I get these pictures from the IPCC um, research um, 
published in 2021. So this is quite recent. And we can see very clearly these uh, red arrows, which is the fossil fuel burning primarily, sending the carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And this is a newly created pathway. The other pathway uh, created by human activities is the land use change. This kind of uh, describing the concept of the urbanization, um, uh, the urbanization reduced the uh, areas of green space and therefore the, the effect of photosynthesis is uh, fixing the carbon into the soil become uh, as are weakening and therefore more carbon dioxide are being sent into the atmosphere. We also see some smaller red arrows here which depicting the added flow um, of the human activities to the already existing carbon flow. And why do we care about this uh, changed uh, carbon cycle? After all, they are just cycling around the Earth. Um, the, the, the reason that now uh, we pay a lot of attention to the carbon cycle is really um, to our own benefit, because we have noticed that the increase of carbon dioxide, considered as one of the greenhouse gases, has a um, strong uh, correlation with the recent increase um, average temperature on the goal. However, this is not the whole pictures of the phenomena of global warming because carbon dioxide is not the only greenhouse gases that uh, exist on the Earth's surface and also other factors will affect the surface temperatures of the Earth as well. This is an uh, um, estimation of relative uh, radiative forcing um, since the time of industrialization. Basically, this is the indicators describing how the carbon, uh, how, how the, the different uh, factors, including greenhouse gases, contribute to the uh, global temperatures. And we see, uh, in addition to the major contributors of carbon dioxide, there are also other greenhouse gases which may be produced um, during the industrial process that has effect and contribute to the warming effect. And also the change of the land use um, will affect the temperature, but in a, by, in the, in a, in the bi-direction way. And we also see the aerosol, which um, you probably will familiar with it in the, in the name of particular matter, which is a very important an air pollutant. They actually reduce the temperature on the, on the globe because they reflect the radiation from the sun directly um, back into the space before the radiation even um, being delivered to the Earth's surface. So the warming effect that we observe today is really a collective um, effect of different factors. And therefore the picture that we see probably need to look like this rather than previously only we only see the correlation between carbon dioxide and and the temperature however in this um in these uh, pictures we see not only carbon dioxide but another compound that's related to carbon has contributed to the global warming which is the the methane ch4 and therefore this incentivizes us to sort of trying to see whether we have the capacities to restore the carbon cycle or reduce the, the carbon in the atmosphere to mitigate or hopefully um, stop the effect of warming. So we now have, talk, uh, have introduced the bio, uh, biogeochemical cycle and we use carbon as an example to demonstrate the tools of pools and flux. And now what I want to also uh, emphasize is that although I only use carbon cycles in this sense, but we need to keep in mind that the biogeochemical cycle of different elements is really interconnected by disturbing carbon cycle. Actually, we will also affect other cycles. Now I want to change the skill, skill a little bit, talking about um, molecules as a carrier of energy. This will also affect the, the global climate. 
And we have already covered these ideas that greenhouse gases will form a physical barriers for energy to be released um, out um, back into the Earth's space. But also molecules itself is a good carrier for energy. On the Earth's surface, um, is particularly true for the water molecules. And the picture here is just um, is a picture that demonstrates um, under the under different um, temperature conditions, actually the distributions, um, the 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 in in the same molecules there is a, a energy containing energy uh, energy dis distributions um, of uh, of the molecules, and if the temperature increase, um, more molecules will carry higher carry higher energies. And this is these characters is um, in particularly important for the water. The importance of water can be highlighted in two aspects. First, it's because its prevalence on the Earth's surface. It's very um, observable in the Earth surface. Seventy percent on of of the Earth surface is covered by water, and it's also biological important because it's composed of majority part of the. The, uh, the physical bodies for the um, living species. Chemically, um, it also become um, a very important energy carrier um, in on the Earth's surface. First, it can um, it exists on the Earth's surface in all three different phases: solid ice, liquid water, and the water vapor in the gas phases. And the converting between these three phases, we need energy um, to facilitate it. And the water is this molecule that has a very high heat capacity, which means um, to increase the, the temperature um, in a water molecules, we need to uh, supply huge amount of the huge amount of the energies in comparison to other chemicals. And also during the uh, transition of the three phases, the what uh, the water molecules need to absorb or release huge amount of the energy as well. And this is just a picture to depict this situation. The, uh, the steep slope um, of the water phases kind of tells us that we need to supply quite a huge amount of the um, energies um, to increase the water temperatures. And a very long horizontal line here depicting the, input, the, the, the energy that required to transform water into the vapor. And also if, if the water is frozen into the, the ice, actually it has to release huge amount of, um, of the uh, uh, energy as well. And during the, the time of this energy releasing and the phase transformation, um, the temperature of the water wouldn't change. With that in mind, we now probably can look into the biogeochemical cycle in another way, which is the floating of the or the movement of the energy on the global uh, on the surface of the globe. And this is a, a hydrological cycle or water cycle um, depicted in the, in a textbook more than ten years ago. So it's sort of the situation and at the time. And I want, want to emphasize the flow of our flux here. So basically, as we described previously, water would evaporate from the ocean and then the, the water vapors could either precipitate back into the ocean or the vapor can be transported into the land and precipitate on the land. If the transportation um, of the vapor from the, um, from the atmosphere above the ocean into the land and the precipitate. Actually, during the precipitation, it's a phase transformation from the, um, from the uh, gas phases back into the uh, liquid phase. So during this process, some of the energy above the ocean has been transformed into the, uh, trans transported uh, into the atmosphere or ambient air um, on the top of the land areas. And this is happening. Look at the um, evaporation rate uh, here and the pre ocean precipitation rate here. We see a difference 
and the surplus of these uh, water vapors is kind of transported into the land. And uh, we are looking at the block um, numbers here. So the difference is uh, around 40, and that is the added precipitation to, to the land. So that kind of implies some of the energy has been transported. And this kind of also tells us whenever we um, see the, the weather change, we actually are seeing the event of energy trans transportations on, uh, on the Earth's surface. And now let's look at the update water cycle. This is also published in IPCC just two years ago. And again, we look at the flux. Similarly, the ocean um, evaporation exceeding the ocean precipitation and the, the, the surplus of the water vapor has been transported and precipitated on land. But the difference is that we saw a larger evaporation, larger amount of evaporation, and also the larger amount of precipitation. Uh, and then the difference between the evaporation and precipitation also increased. That means um, more water vapor are being transported to the land and, and um, in the form of precipitation. And that also implies larger amount of the energy has been trans transported to the land surface. So with this um, difference, just um, about a decade or two decades, we kind of see that energy transform transfer or transportation on the Earth's surface seems to be um, speed up in the recent years. And it's, um, it can be observed in the form of some kind of weather patterns. And this is probably due to the, the um, emission of greenhouse gases. And these pictures uh, from the IPCC depicting the process of how the warming effect affects the precipitation and the weather on the Earth's surface. Um, at the beginning, the increased greenhouse gases actually decreased the amount of the precipitations. That's, um, that's talking about the time frame in the days and months. But gradually, the precipitation on the land will be increased due to the redistribution of the, the energy. And in years or decades, we now see the increased evaporation and the precipitation globally. And that's the time we start to see a lot of um, heavy precipitation that was not expected before and the flooding events that's uh, devastating the human societies. We also see some prolonged, uh, pro prolonged droughts in certain areas. That's probably also uh, due to the redistribution of the energy and the water molecules on the Earth's surface. So basically the warming effect has effect has warming uh, the warming effect has been um, contributed primarily by the the increased amount of the greenhouse gases carbon dioxide and methane and it has affect the water cycle and therefore we see uh, more extreme weather um, on the earth's surface which affect the livelihood of human society that is why we are trying to restore the carbon cycle and the aim of restoring the carbon cycle is not really for the cycle itself. Rather, we want to reduce the carbon dioxide or greenhouse gases in the atmosphere to the degree that the warming effect can be controlled. So if these objectives are uh, achieved, but the, water, uh, the carbon cycle are not completely restored, maybe for the sake of human society is okay. And how do how do we think how do we um, use different approach to uh, achieve these objectives? And the, the figures here presenting what we have talked about. So the figure A is the undisturbed carbon cycle before, and the figure B and uh, the red colors of arrows and also the uh, colors in the pools depicting the uh, changed carbon cycle balanced due to the human activities, primarily burning the fossil fuel. And the figure C and the D kind of uh, trying to 
describe how we may be able to reduce the atmospheric uh, greenhouse gases by changing the flow of flux of the carbon cycle. And the first thing that we might be able to do is, of course, actively putting the carbon back into the lithosphere. And the orange arrows kind of uh, representing this. And the way we can do it is first, of course, reverse the land use activities. We expand the green vegetations to facilitate the photosynthesis. And therefore, the carbon fixations can be facilitated. Or uh, nowadays, there is a new technology called carbon capture and storage, which directly extracts the carbon dioxide in the gas phases in the atmosphere and inserts them back into the pores of the rocks and then using the high pressure or some chemical method to, um, to make the carbon dioxide stay in the ground. So that, that's another um, artificial method to change the carbon cycle. Or we, of course, should stop creating the new flow from the lithosphere into the atmosphere. So we see uh, the promotion of a lot of different alternative energy generation methods, which want to um, move us, ourselves away from the dependence of the fossil fuel as the energy sources. There's also another idea. Since we have already extracted some of the carbon from the lithosphere, maybe we need to use it as frequent and as much as possible before it was released into the atmosphere. So basically what we are doing in Taiwan, um, trying to make the be best use of the, our waste by recycling and the classified the waste or Later on, in some of the waste management uh, treatment, we recovered the energy or materials from the waste is um, kind of fall into these categories of mitigating the disturbed carbon cycle and therefore contribute to the um, management of the warming effect. The two primary greenhouse gases, as we see previously, are carbon dioxide. And we have already learned that the fossil fuel would be the major contributors to the atmosphere. So if we want to manage the carbon dioxide in the uh, atmosphere, of course, reduce the using fossil fuel will be the primary uh, target. And also the uh, land use and land use probably need to be better managed and therefore we sort of restore the capacities of uh, photosynthesis and therefore the carbon fixations. But another uh, greenhouse gases method, which, I, um, which is more relevant to the waste management that we are going to talk about today, um, is also important. And from the IPCC report, we see that uh, the burning of fossil fuel also produce um, excessive carbon uh, uh, the method in, into uh, released into the um, into the atmosphere. The issues about uh, about the method probably is not about the quantity, not only about the quantities and uh, it was being released into the atmosphere, but about the capacity of method that can retain the energy on the Earth's surface. Actually, one molecular of carbon dioxide has this capability of retaining 80 times more of the energies um, on the Earth's surface in comparisons to carbon dioxide. So you can, you can see that um, one molecules released into the atmosphere will have a huge, much huge, uh, larger effect in comparisons to the carbon dioxide in terms of warming effect. So IPCC also um, kind of depict how much uh, um, methane was being released into the atmosphere due, due to the human activities. Fossil fuel is still one of the important um, human activities, but we now also see some agricultural practice and the waste uh, management um, coming into the pictures. So we do need to reduce the, the waste that primarily are being landfilled and change the waste management style. And on the subject of the warming potential of the um, methane, I want to uh, bring up this concept that because of these strong warming uh, capacities of the uh, methane, now if we burn the methane 
perhaps for the energy um, as the energy sources, it will be converted into the carbon dioxide. Although carbon dioxide is still the greenhouse gases, because of, but because of the reduction of the warming effect by eliminating the method, we also consider this as one of the effect to uh, one of the approach to manage the warming effect um, in the atmosphere. So now let's move into the, the waste management and uh, the relationship between the waste management and the global cycle. And this is the pictures of the excavation um, in the area where I worked. Um, um, I, I was visiting this site um, brought by my uh, colleagues who, who is an anthropologist. I just want to demonstrate that Actually, the waste produced thousands of years ago now has become a research subject as the evidence to describing the human activities at the time. So it, uh, Zhejiang is the coastal province, and therefore people who live in Zhejiang 8,000 years ago consume huge amount of seafood. And this is the shell, the remain of the shell that was discovered from the excavation. And 7,000 years ago, the humans, we can already uh, find the fossilized uh, rice in, um, in, the, in, the, in the historical site, which implied that people start to learn cultivate rice at the time. And for me, who, uh, who um, studied the subject of waste management, this just tells me that actually the production of the waste is um, closely related to the lifestyles of human activities. And in the old time, the waste management may not be such a big problem because the lifestyle make the waste generated mostly biodegradable. And this is, uh, this is the statistics um, of percentage of the waste that has been produced um, um, in, the, in the modern days. And this, again, is the data uh, extracted from the IPCC. And they, they are, the data are global, but I want to um, just use this as a um, demonstration. So I only show the pictures of Australia and, uh, and New Zealand. The biodegradable waste um, that was being um, statistically recorded in Australia and New Zealand in the, in the data collected in 2006 are here, the food waste, uh, green, the, the orange one would be the paper and cardboard, and the, the one in the stripes is the proportion of the wood waste produced. But if we look back and look at the statistics um, at more close to the recent time, we see the huge reductions of the proportion of this biodegradable, uh, biodegradable waste and the increase of the plastic in the waste. And also we see some new categories of the waste that was being produced, um, being categorized in the statistics. One would be the garden waste. This probably marked the um, improved uh, waste sorting um, practice. And therefore the garden waste can be treated specifically based on its characteristics. But interestingly, nappy, which is the diaper that has been used has occupied a noticeable part of the waste, waste uh, proportion. And the nappies is these things that, the waste of nappies, these things that combined with both plastic um, product and also some biological in ingredient. So these increase the um, difficulties of uh, managing the waste. So you see the change of lifestyle in indeed um, make the types of the waste more complex than before. And the picture that we show here is the percentage. So it didn't really reveal another problem, even for this nature or biodegradable um, ingredient because of the change of the lifestyle, actually the quantity of those waste has increased in the developed countries or cities, okay? And of course, we now need to deal with the man-made uh, man waste as well. Focusing on the carbon cycle and the, the major uh, issues that we are dealing with is probably the carbon that has been extracted from the fossil fuel. Plastic is the product 
of the petrochemical process, which is part of the um, part of the uh, process that's using fossil fuel. So if we um, control the uh, the uh, waste management of this man-made um, product more um, sophisticatedly, we may be able to um, reduce this um, carbon of uh, carbon from the fossil fuel being released into the atmosphere. And the contemporary um, treatment to the to the um, to the uh, contemporary waste treatment, that or I should say the traditional waste treatment are two. There are two uh, major categories. One is landfill. Another is incineration. A landfill is to pile up the waste into uh, defined locations, and because and the, the waste are compacted. So sometimes the anaerobic oxidation would happen, which is the oxidation happening with very little oxygens or no oxygens. And this kind of process would produce both carbon dioxide and methane. So if the, uh, the landfill are not well controlled, we, uh, it contributes to the atmospheric um, greenhouse gases. For incineration, it's more direct and the oxidation of the carbon, um, organic carbon will produce carbon dioxide. So the picture here kind of depicts this situation. But for the landfill, it also contributes to the carbon emission in a way that it occupied huge amount of space and therefore the land use change, um, it contributes to the land use change um, of the carbon emissions. But recently, because of some um, idea, new ideas uh, that develop uh, and also the technology, yes, the technologies development, we have different types of uh, waste management uh, uh, approach that we can use. So if we combine it, for specific waste treatment, maybe we can reduce the carbon dioxide sending to the atmosphere and recycle some of the carbon back into the human society or, or the urban system that we lived in. This is um, the comparisons of different uh, uh, development status um, of the cities and the, the way they treat the waste. And just look at the material flow um, of those their waste treatment of in Vienna we see a more complex treatment uh, process which means they they are sorting the waste better and then they have different uh, a lot of tools to treat different waste in comparisons to Damascus and the darker cities. However, we can also notice that the, the, the cities like Vienna with higher economic capacities, they actually produce more waste. And therefore, the amount of landfill waste are still um, noticeable in comparisons to the cities um, that's less developed. And to mitigate the waste, actually, the, there is this uh, criteria called the waste management hierarchy that has been established. And for, for the audience, probably you have known some part of this. Part of this um, because of the uh, because of the, the uh, education from the government, we, we say three R, recycle, reuse, and reduce. Actually, these are in the top of the waste management um, hierarchy. We prevent, the, we prevent or reduce the consumption of the product, so stop the uh, waste flow at the beginning, or we reuse the items that we have obtained as much as possible um, so that we retain the carbon in our society uh, longer. If the waste has to be disposed before it was being landfilled or incinerated, probably we will try be our best to recover the materials or energies from it. And then finally, if we um, uh, we kind of exhaust all the methods that we can um, get the resources from those waste items, then we send it to the landfill as the final disposal. But hopefully, at that stage, the amount of waste has been reduced dramatically. And European Union has used a lot of legal um, framework and directive to facilitate their member states um, to do that. And here is the timeline of the um, 
regulations that my student and I kind of summarized. And for the EU, um, at the early, uh, at the late 1990s, uh, one of the important uh, waste management uh, pro, uh, directive has been uh, promulgated, which is the landfill directive. With the directive, the EU um, government actually set some of the tar uh, a lot of the target for the member state to achieve to reduce the amount of the waste that has been that will be uh, delivered to the landfill, and consecutively. Uh, in 2000 and 2018, um, the EU promulgated more um, waste management related directives and also together more target to set. And in response to that, UK actually um, established some of the regulations within the countries. And the later on at the city level, um, I'm using Nottingham as the examples. They also respond to the national regulations and set their own target to do the, the waste reductions. So in terms of uh, policy making, actually the EU uh, directive has the effect, has the effect of the EU directive has penetrated to uh, local um, areas like Nottingham in the UK. And the implementations of those regulate local regulation and the target actually has a beneficial effect to the waste management of Nottingham. And uh, the picture here depict, uh, the, the black line here depict the waste um, produced per person in Nottingham. And we see a gradual decrease between 2000, the beginning of 2000 and the 2016, uh, 17. This is not easy as we already learned that actually as the society developed, the amount of the waste generated usually increased. And therefore the waste prevention does take some effort. And also we see these colors of the bar, the, the bar um, indicated the amount of the waste that has been treated. And the color, uh, label, the, the color labels different treatment method. So we see from the beginning, uh, primarily the waste was being landfilled and the other one is incinerated. But uh, uh, at the beginning, uh, Nottingham, government, Nottingham City has already come using the incinerator as the uh, energy generating um, facilities, so we call it waste to energy uh, approach. But gradually we see other colors uh, emerged, which is uh, the, the, the green color of recycling. And also they use some of the waste to produce different film to be burned for energies. So this is the approach of Nottingham trying to manage the treatment uh, and the flow of their waste to reduce the, um, the waste being landfilled. And we estimate the, the material flow um, based on the, how Nottingham has diversified their uh, waste management approach. Um, we, we established uh, three scenario. Actually, there are four. One I will show later, but the, the uh, blue uh, text here kind of highlight during different periods, Nottingham has introduced uh, more um, waste management approach to divert the material of the waste into a different treatment method. And based on that, those treatment methods and the material flow analyzed, we can calculate uh, the carbon emission to treat a per tons of, uh, of the waste. And we see from the scenario one at the beginning of 2000, um, 2000s and, and towards the end, of our an, an analysis period 2017, the carbon emitted by in treating per tons of the, um, of the waste has uh, reduced dramatically. And similarly, we see the, the carbon emission from the landfill reduced because the amount of the waste um, that was being stored in the landfill has been reduced. We also see an interesting um, phenomenon phenomena in our scenario four. This is based on the material flow and statistics that's uh, collected for the waste um, in 2019 and 2020. And the political event has affected this um, waste management approach because UK now has left the EU. So some of the flow that 
my um, between the uh, European countries and the, the UK now has been stopped. So Nottingham has to think about a new way to treat those um, ways that used to be able to um, be transported to the UK for better treatment. And therefore we see some slightly increased carbon emissions. That kind of marked the political event, the impact of political event into the waste management and the, therefore the carbon emissions. So we can see, we can say that actually the, the policy from the European Union has successfully driven the change of waste management in the local area like, like Nottingham. And now, since the, 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 the UK, UK has left the EU, then they kind of um, lose one layer of policy um, control of the waste management. But we think this is also a, a good opportunity to look at if without the policy instrument like the EU directive, what are what can uh, what would incentivize a cities to improve their waste management approach? And the um, I use this um, type uh, ternary typology, the triangle um, triangle figures that depict three different um, ways of treating the waste. One is the disposal. Um, this means the primarily means the landfill. One is recovery materials from the waste, and one is uh, to recovery energy from the waste. So basically, the waste management approach that we encourage is to move from the disposal-based approach to either the material recovery or the energy recovery waste or the mix of the two. For the case of Nottingham, actually, they have choose to move from the landfill-based or disposal-based um, the uh, management approach to more or less um, energy recovery um, approach um, for, for the waste management. However, if you remember the waste uh, hierarchy that we uh, look at, waste management hierarchy we look at, actually material recovery seems to be encouraged more than the, than the energy recovery approach. So, um, so we in these sections we kind of demonstrate that prevention um, of the waste waste flow probably is the most preferred um, approach for um, for the waste management to stop the carbon emissions, and the landfill is the least favored. But in between, there are several layers um, of in preferential order in general to. Um, to stop the, the carbon emission or greenhouse gas emissions uh, from the landfill, but um, we might see some variations and the consideration um, there um, for the for the uh, in the next sections. Okay. So the ideas of waste management um, uh, contribute to the mitigating of the global. Um, global warming is only part of the consideration of the waste management. Actually, by recovering the energy or um, the materials from the waste, we kind of view the waste as the um, resources rather than the, the waste that needs to be um, that needs to be dealt with. And this kind of um, connect to the ideas of establishing a resilient city. If we consider waste as resources and the recycle use them um, in a circle within a city system, actually we will reduce the dependence of the cities to the external environment. This is a preferred operations of a city in terms of some kind of um, city risk, risk, um, uh, risk mitigations. And in, in, the, in uh, studies, also Scholar has suggested if a cities can find Another cities that they can exchange the resources that's recovered from the waste. Maybe this is also an ideal way to uh, think think of waste as a, a resources. So the preferred system would be an autonomous system that you can reuse the resources as much as possible, or the interdependent system, which you find a partner that can exchange the resources together with you. But we don't want to have the end the city need endless input of the resources, or they just 
output of the resources um, out, out of the system, that would be not sustainable. And we also see in the case of Nottingham, they have choose to uh, uh, reuse the resources as the energy uh, sources. And this links to these ideas of circular economy. Actually, the circular economy is defined by, uh, is, is viewed as a way to using the um, financial incentives to encourage people to reuse the resources as much as possible. And the definition of the EU and, um, and, and the United Nations are similar. But the United Nations emphasizing the new job created and the new sector created, whereas the EU definition kind of emphasizing minimizing the, the waste during the process. And if we if we link the biogeochemical cycle that we learned today, and if we if we link the biogeochemical um, that we learned today and these ideas of circular economy, probably we will find that in the long run, actually the element or in human society's view, the resources are being circulated on the earth surface anyways with, with or without human interventions. So by sort of highlighting this um, circular economy concept, we are just trying to extract further layers of the um, benefit from the circular circulated um, resources and the element. And this is the statistics of the entire EU member state and how they treat their waste. And the uh, dark gray um, bar here highlight the waste that has been treated um, in, length as, uh, in, a, in the way of landfilling. And we can see that from 2014, 2016 to 2019, this great area has been reduced dramatically. And it was replaced by different colors of bars, which representing different methods of treatment. So the EU policy seems to work overall um, to their member state. I also want to highlight some uh, specific countries. They are, things that policy cannot do. For example, Greece and Romania, their landfill rate is kept at a very high level even after these 15, 15 years of efforts, EU trying to encourage them to convert their um, waste treatment styles. So basically policy might not um, work 100%. On the other hand, there is an, uh, a two uh, country that's quite interesting, and we want to look at it further, which is Denmark and Netherlands. They actually has reached the target of EU directive at the very early stage of the very early stage of the um, directive promulgation. But we see the statistics that reflecting they continue to diversify their management approach. And we wonder what incentivize them. And they didn't really follow the waste management hierarchy either because towards the uh, end of this period, 2019, most of their waste are being sent to the, uh, in, uh, the facility that's incinerate, incinerator. However, the energy are, are recovered from the incineration process. This is pop probably because um, Netherlands and also the um, Netherlands and Denmark are in the uh, colder regions of the globe. So in their consideration for their own benefit, actually energy requirement is more uh, important than the, um, the resources recovery in their country. And therefore, naturally, for the benefit's sake, they will convert the waste management into an energy generation facilities. And this fits the concept of circular economy. You just extract as much um, financial or other benefit from the circulations of the resources as possible. And therefore, I would like to say that um, the guideline of um, waste treatment hierarchy may not apply to every country, especially after they come, they reduce the landfill to a very uh, to to 
to a very minimal extent. And if we consider this waste management and the sustainable development um, ideas that we uh, mentioned at the very beginning, actually the waste management can contribute to restoring and rebalancing the bio uh, biogeochemical cycle, although initially they actually is the source contributing to the global warming. And the development of the new technology and policy making probably both facilitate such a change of the waste management that um, from becoming the solution rather than the source of the problems. And at the beginning, we talk about this spectrum of ecocentric and the and anthropogenic and um, scholars has more detailed uh, classification of the views on sustainable development by different government and also philosophical or academia uh, theories. But let's look at just this spectrum. Actually, in between the ecocentric and the anthropocentric views on sustainable development, in the middle, it sees uh, another view that's called technocentric. So basically, um, by applying the new um, technology into the waste um, management, we are taking probably a more technocentric views on sustainable development. However, we cannot forget that actually prevention and the recycling are a more effective way to mitigate the carbon emissions from the waste management. If we apply this approach, this probably will move us to more towards the ecocentric view on the sustainable development. So that's my version of fitting the waste management into different views of sustainable development and perhaps the human environmental uh, relations. And we previously have said that there are scholars who argue that actually we cannot separate ourselves from the environment. And hopefully the lecture today kind of demonstrated to you, actually we are part of the biogeochemical cycle on earth and this cannot be avoided. So ultimately from the biogeochemical view, we are part of the, uh, the environment. And the, as a human being, we probably need to manage our own behavior better and therefore we can uh, peacefully coexist with the, um, with the uh, already ongoing biogeochemical cycle on the Earth's surface. And that will be the end of my um, presentation today. I noticed that I probably are massively over time, but I would be happy to take any questions um, after the presentation. And I also provide some references that I based on in preparing this uh, lecture. If you are interested, feel free to, to look into those researches. Thank you very much. Thank you. 呃, 今天的台湾呢, 是一层, 一片厚厚的云层, 遮挡了蓝色的天空。那远方呢, <笑>在讲这个空气中很多我们看不见的东西然后我又瞄到我桌上的小垃圾桶接近最后的投影片呢的一个规范
好，那除了我给唐唐唐老师一些小小的回馈呢，我们接下来要呃再给呃我们的听众朋友呢一些时间可以跟唐老师直接的互动。那您可以举手，也可以在聊天板那留下您的留言，那跟我们分享或提问。那刚刚在唐老师演讲过程里面，其实我们已经有几个问题了。如果您有开那个聊天板，其实也看得到。那我就稍微简述一下，就是我们的叶老师呢有讲到说，这个 Brexit 就是我们那个英国脱欧之后呢，这个 Nottingham stop sending some west to Europe for treatment， 就是把这个垃垃圾已经比较少呃送过去欧洲去处理啦。那 Can you tell us more about where the Waste materials were sent, and what was the treatment? Now, do you know? Actually, I, I, my knowledge to the、uh, waste treatment of Nottingham are mostly from the statistics, and the, those、uh, statistics I present to you would be the ones that we know at the moment. We need to contact Nottingham City Council to see whether they are willing to share more information. But I can offer a little bit more.、Um, Ideas from this analysis. When we see the increased carbon emissions, we kind of shocked. But the thing is, it didn't increase a lot. And the other thing is that perhaps because of these types of waste that was sending、um, out of the the out of the UK for the treatment, now we cannot、um, do that.、Um, as far as I know, in general, the the UK probably. The 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 waste that they send out to outside of the UK, not necessarily、um, European countries, perhaps is more、um, of those、um, man-made device. For example, electronic waste, and then they are the combination of the plastic and the metals. Therefore,、um, in terms of carbon emission, I think the plastic part prob probably、um, added the burden of the local waste. Treatment, because、um, as we can see in the statistics, the diversified method that Nottingham used one is the compost, which、um, which will be re more related to the bio、uh, the organic matters, or、uh, for example the garden waste and the food, and the the other would be the、uh, making the unrecyclable materials. They kind of isolated from the recycling facilities. And into another form of film. This kind of required a process, one or some an anaerobic digestion process.、Uh, one of them is called pyrolysis. So essentially, they are converting some of the、um, organic matter that may not be、uh, producing the energy so efficiently through a chemical process, become a film that can be. You know, can be used for extracting the energies, but we can imagine that if the electronic device, in combination of these unburnable,、uh, unburnable parts of the metals and the plastic, then this will increase the burden of the of kind of separating the two parts. And I think that will be the challenge of the Nottingham af after Brexit. Otherwise, they just have to increase the、um, financial、uh, support. To sending this、uh, waste to different parts for for the treatment.、Mm. How about、uh, in China or Asia in general? Are they using the same approach, similar or very different in in your understanding?、Um, in China, my personal experience is nowadays they heavily、um, push for the、um, sorting the waste, but、um, I think. People on the ground still require some education to be able to、um, properly sort. And then,、um, I have undergraduate student who kind of pay attention to the label of teaching you how to sort the waste. I think it's not very effective.、Um, but there are two things. One is that、um, you know the development status of China. They they are kind of.、Uh, It, it, in the the curve of very fast and、uh, developing, and in our in our observation, the statistics actually、um, at the beginning of the、um, the develop of a society, their food waste proportion will increase、yeah, dramatically, and then、um, other different types of waste will gradually added. So I think China. At the moment, are still at the stage trying to separating the food waste from other waste because just by treating the food waste、um, 
environmental in an environmental friendly way, they can reduce a lot of carbon emission already. However, food waste is not the waste that you can easily incinerate them because food contains huge amount of moisture. And therefore, if you directly burn them, actually a lot of energy will be um, used in evapor evaporating the water rather than actually um, getting the um, heat energy out of other organic matters. So I think composting probably will be one of the important um, methods that China will need to apply in their uh, waste management approach. Yeah. And since you mentioned that, there is also another uh, things that I think may have uh, influenced actually the global waste management strategy, because ha it has been uh, quite a long time that uh, China is the receiver of the uh, electronic waste from all over the world. And then they have these people who didn't work very you know, safely in separating and isolating the, the um, elements or the materials from those food waste to form for, man for money. But I think several years um, ago, China actually has um, implemented this regulation that they stop the importing of those um, electronic waste. And therefore, now a lot of developed countries producing huge amount of electronic waste start to think about how do I, you know, treat my own electronic waste without sending it to China. I think that will also be an interesting topic to look at. And the impact of that to the, the waste management in many countries. Yeah. different countries, they treat their waste different in different ways, in different approach. Yeah, they treat 呃，废弃物有很大的影响，所以像刚刚说的 food waste， 如果我们住在比较南方的地方，因为我们的食物可能汤水就更多，所以我们要想怎么去处理它，跟可能住在比较北方或者是比较干燥地区的人，因为他们的食物可能就是比较干燥的东西，那他们可以想的就是怎么样去处理他们食物的方法也会也会不一样。然后就是刚刚讲的，有一些地方可能它产出的这个呃。金属就是不能够不可燃的东西比较多，那他们可能建立的这个呃这个 waste management 的方法就会比较想到的是 energy 呃 material recovery， 就是怎么把这些金属跟不可燃的东西把它重新萃取出来，变成新的原料。但是如果是比如说在北方的国家，像刚刚说的这个 Denmark 跟 n e t h e r l a n d 跟荷兰的话。因为他们冬天需要呃暖气比较多，所以他们就发现说，哎，我需要这个能源。然后这个 incinerator 就是这个焚化炉，它如果是有这个嗯这个吸收热、吸取热的这个机制在里面的话，事实上他们就可以直接用这个焚化炉产生的热去供给他们这个家户所需要的冬天的暖气。那其实对他们来说很方便，而且在这个。呃，转换的过程中，它可能会比较没有什么 energy loss 的问题，所以每一个国家都会根据它的需求跟它产出的这个嗯废弃物的形态跟组合，它必须要去想怎么样对它最有最有效，怎么样对它对它最有利，所以这也就是这个循环经济的一个非常重要的概念在里面。这里面两件事情，就是一个是我们一直认为这个厨余是。好的，有机的东西，但是如果厨余是进到了焚化炉、嗯，反而是一个不好的事情。对啊，所以在台湾，我们不是这个呃，至少在台北，我看到我我们我回家的时候，我们就是一本一般是鼓励把厨余跟其他的其他的垃圾是分分开的，然后他们厨余可能会去做别的用途，这这也很好。然后这个 food waste 也是一个很有趣的题目哦，因为。之前，呃，我看一些 food waste 的 research， 有一个有趣的 history， 就是美国，它在一开始的时候是有一段时间，它是允许，就是这一些厨余拿去做重复的，拿去做动物的食物，就是把这些厨余拿去去喂。嗯，其他的动物成为一个饲料的概念，但是有一段时间，因为某一个这个传染病的关系，他们发现这个厨余可能会
这个就是等于是 facilitate the the spread of disease， 所以他们明令规定不能够用属于当做动物的食物。那在这个这段过程当中，那处于要怎么处理，就变成另外一个课题。对对对，就是说这个法规还有这个社会状况什么的，都会影响到我们对这个废弃物处理应该要怎么去呃去想它的很很很多不同的这个考虑因素。对对，就像台湾早期是说厨余要喂猪，那现在呢，嗯、可能就是朝向呃去做有机肥料的一个方向，在努力。对对，那其实刚刚也回答了一个问题，我本来在问，想说，在日本我们看到它的分类不是回收、嗯、可回收不可回收、嗯，而是分为可燃不可燃。对那可能就是跟您说的。跟那个暖气是有关系的，跟产生热热量是有关系的事情、嗯。对，最近我才读到一个资料，就是说，呃，在北欧有几个国几个 city， 不是国家，几个 city 是一个城市，他们的这个冬季供暖几乎。百分之百都是依靠这个焚化炉所产生的热能，然后在亚洲只有一个 city 被嗯提到，就是 Osaka， Osaka 就是大阪，他们的这个焚化的这个热也可以就是变成他们冬季供暖的一个非常呃、嗯、非常好的这个 source 这样子，对，所以日本他们是尽量利用这个废弃物去做这个。呃，去燃烧，然后产生热能，产生能能量的，对他们也是走这个 approach， 而不是去。可是其实日本的这个，就是从这个呃、uh, electronic device 里面 extract 金属的这个技术也是还蛮发达的，所以他们对于这个废弃物如何重复利用，的确是花了很多功夫。对。太有趣了！今天学到的并不是只有垃圾怎么分类跟处理，而是它还有要因地制宜、因人、因国家制宜的这一个因素在里面。没错，所以我觉得有时候教育还蛮重要的。然后也就是说，虽然我们可大家都有一个非常呃 general 的概念，说垃圾要分类，但是其实垃圾怎么分类，真的。会影响到它后来的处理效率，跟它是不是能够真的就是 mitigate。呃 ，climate change 会有会有很直接的相关的影响。对对对我们再请唐老师回答最后一个问题好了。我们在两点聊天板上面呢，还有一个问题是 ：Is there any evidence that plants will grow fast and vastly in the result of global warming? What are the pros and cons? 啊、oh, ，这个问题很有趣。呃、uh, ，其实这个 plant will grow fast with the 嗯、um,。With the global warming, 我我有一些同学他们在看 statistics。中国的东北其实也算是他们的一个粮仓，因为他们的这个东北的平原的土是黑土，所以是营养很好的。但是呢，因为东北是在北边嘛，所以他们其实冬天是非常寒冷的，所以可以呃做这个农业的这个期间，其实都是在就是春夏的时候。那其实，在这个 global warming 的 process 里面，我们已经发现，就是说，在东北这个区域，如果我们去看刚刚我们提到的，就是这个 precipitation， 其实，在东北的 precipitation 一年好像比一年就是会逐年的增加，这是一个。当然，当然就是暖化的话，他们的气候也变得比较比较暖和，所以有可能他们可以种更多的。他们说庄稼就是更多的农农农作物可以在东北被被种出来，这是目前看到的情况。而且他们的确就是在开发很多的这个呃本来没有在种植的地方，他们现在都把它开发成种植地，因为现在条件好像更允许这个样子了。那可是另外一件事情，呃，我在跟学生的讨论当中，呃，我们觉得就是说这样子的这个。情况可能就是说，温度比较高的时候，它可能会 facilitate 呃、um, metabolism， 所以这个植物它就可以长得比较好，或者是长得比较多。但是这有两项限制条件，一个是说，如果这个 warming effect 到了某一个极致，就是每一个植物或者是其实生物都有它最适的生长温度，那是一个 range。而不是说哦，一个只有一个温度。那现在在东北，好像因为增温的关系，这个大部分的这个这个温度是在鼓励这个植物的生长。但是如果变得更热的时候，可能就会急速的，就是大家说的悬崖式的掉落，就变成是没有办法了。然后再来就是这个 precipitation 也是一样的。那另外还有就是说我刚刚有讲了，东北它这个呃。
这个农作物为什么大家喜欢在那边种，就是因为他们的土质很好，是黑土，所以里面的营养很多。那这个东西也会因为我们就是大量的去种植这个农作物之后呢，其实如果我们没有去注意这个轮轮根，就是所谓的 rotation 的话，其实同一种作物在同一个地方，它要吸收的营养都是同样的，它可能会把土地，就是我们说的地力就会被损损耗掉，因为它一直在吸取同样的营养。所以这个就是刚刚有提到，就是说。Carbon cycle 跟 nitrogen cycle 它是互相影响的，因为 nitrogen 就是土壤里面的影响，而且已经很久前就有研究说，就是土壤里面的 nutrition 如果是以 nitrogen 作为以氮作为代表的话，它会跟这个光合作用产生非常直接的关系。就是说，呃，这个氮氮的浓度高的话，光合作用就会快。所以这并不仅仅是温度的问题。第一个是温度，它必须要在适宜的温度里面，然后还有就是说其他环境的配合，比如说这个土壤里面的营养是不是还还有还呃还均衡这样子，所以不能够给一个绝对的答案。但是目前在比较北边的国家，可能对他们来说，沃米是一个 benefit， 因为他们有很多。这个地方，他们可以去开发成为成为农业用地，但是我们也可以看到，在中国的南边，本来我们觉得一年三货啊，这这些地方，渐渐的我们发现这个呃稻米的 productivity 可能反而没有像东北那样上升，他们反而是出现了一些问题。我刚刚本来说我们要回答最后一个问题，但是我发现一个非常有趣的问题。我们今天有一个、嗯、呃专家啊、哦，应该算是专家，那刚好住在日本。那他提到了焚化炉的排热通常有装上热交换器做能源的转换之后才会排出热气体。嗯、那最近呢，想要使用这些热气体去做 direct air capture， 去做这个 CO2 的 capture。但是这些能源怎么样使用跟取出？嗯、要不要做 direct air capture 就会变成一个经济效益的问题。有的时候它反而会增加 carbon footprint。所以回到台湾呢，就很少台湾听到台湾在做这个 carbon cycle， 呃，包括这个 n cycle、CO2、CH2、f o r monitor 的这些部分。您觉得台湾未来的大方向有怎么样走会比较好？哇，这是很大问题耶！我也不敢说，我觉得很专业的问题。<笑>对，可是。Carbon capture 的确就是说，如果我们用循环经济来讲的话，的确就是像这位陈陈先生陈先生说的，就是说我们也要去考虑说，是不是在这个程序中反而增加了更多的这个碳碳排，因为毕竟你也是经过了一些程序。但是我可以嗯、呃、提供一一个想法，就是说其实。CO2 它本身也可以变成是一个资源，所以当我们 capture CO2 之后，如果我们能够把它纯化到某一个程度的话，也许在工业或者是像我们有时候实验室也是需要这个纯的二氧化碳做实验啊什么的，所以它可以变成，如果有一个纯化程序，它的确可以变成一个资源。对，那就要看这个资源是不是，这个资源是不是嗯。有效，或者是产生这个资源的方式，是不是 cost benefit？ 还有一个就是说，呃，我突然想到，就是现在就是大家都在 focus 在这个碳排上面，其实还有另外一个非常现实的问题，就是因为哦，呃，这个碳税跟碳交易现在快要变成是一个世界的趋势，所以刚刚陈先生说的就是说啊，现在可能不 cost effective， 但是可能到。接下来几年以后，渐渐大家就会发现这个 CO2 capture 这件事情变成是必须的，因为它会减少你要交的碳税。那我觉得在台湾的话，可能这个会是另外一个 drive， 就是说大家去想说我的废弃物处理要怎么样去减碳这件事，或者是重复利用这个废弃物里面的碳，而是呃不要让它马上直接就排到空气当中。对对对，但我可能没有完全这个回答到陈先生的问题，可是因为我真的不敢说我我能够就是为台湾的废弃物处理指出一个比较大的方向，可能我还要再多看一下，就是说目前台湾废弃物生产的比例是什么啊？还有大家的这个 daily life 的情况是怎么样？然后我们可以去去想这个事情。对，啊，陈老师你好，那个石老师你好，我是陈先生，我想说跟你们打个招呼，就是谢谢你好。谢谢你好，谢谢你们提供这些问题。其实因为我是刚好做能源方面的研究，然后所以才问这些问题、嗯。然后最后有一个很小的问题，你觉得要怎么样应用到这些 cycle， 把它运用到宇宙相关的事业呢？嗯
，应用到哪里相关的事业？呃，例例如说是月球或是火星，我们也是想要做一些的 cycle，、嗯、就是目前你刚讲的水、嗯、水的 cycle， 因为水它的 heat capacity 非常大嘛，所以现在 Toyota 他们想要利用燃料电池做 high。就是燃料电池做水的 cycle， 因为燃料电池在在宇宙可以把它分解成水跟氧，水跟嗯啊、呃呃、水跟氢气，水氢跟氧，氢气就是一个能源，嗯、它可以当做推动维持人人类的电力的生活嘛，然后水可以做水 cycle， 对啊，所以我感觉水好像、嗯、水的 cycle 好像在宇宙是一个蛮好用的一个分子，对啊，可能不晓得您在做。这些 cycle 的研究做 LCA evaluation 的时候，有开始想到宇宙相关的研究吗？我很诚实的说，我还没有想到，因为之前呃，就是像我们今天在这个演讲一开始的时候，在讲的这个 pro and flux 的的 model， 我们用的有一个非常基本假设，就是我们假设地球是一个 enclosed system。所以如果你现在说啊，我们要把这些呃化学物质移到另外一个星球上，那我们的 system 就要扩大，那整个这个 material flow 跟这个 cycle 可能就会产生一些比较大的变化，跟我们现在了解的 cycle 可能就会。出现不同，但我也不知道，就是比如说像您提到的这个头塔这个 idea， 真的是很 amazing。他他打算要把地球上多少的水移到别的星球上去，那其实这个把这个破里面的东西拿掉的话，可能也会影响整个 cycle 的平衡。因为刚刚我们说，呃，水它是很好的 en 呃 energy carrier， 但是它另外一个功能可能就是在 sta 它可以 stabilize temperature。就是它有保温或者是你维持温度的效果，所以如果你把很多地球上很多的水都移开了之后，是不是会对整个地球的这个温度的调节产生另外一种影响？这也是可以去讨论的。那就要那那就是另外一个 modeling 的的问题了。对对对对。可是为什么这个分解分解水跟分解水成为氧跟氢的这个 process 不能在地球上面地球上面进行，要把它移到？月球上或别的星球上面，呃，在地球上面也是可以进行啊，但是呃，地球上面现在就是电力的问题嘛，电力要从哪里来？那呃，因为现在日本全部都在，日本跟欧洲都在推要要用电动车啊，要形成电力社会，所以就等于说你的电力，嗯、我我们不能一次转换，把电力是从转换成再生能源，要。要一步一步转换过来，等于是说这几年的碳排放也许会突然上升，嗯、因为所有全世界所有的国家都在强强调电动车，然后我们我们什么东西要电力化，那可能在可能我们自己的估算呢、啊，可能是在二零三五年左右，可能真的是碳排放会慢慢在往下掉。那嗯，那个水在。呃，我是觉我我我现在目前在做很多研究是跟能源有关的，但很多是就是像你刚刚讲的，就是一个密闭空，你要想到一个循环，它是一个密闭空间。那很多很可能很多密闭空间的呃研究，也许不太适合在地球上面做，但但是可能因为最近日本跟美国很在抢宇宙生意的时候，我就会想要常常在想说自己做的一些热化学研究、电化学研究能不能用到宇宙里面。对啊，我觉得我觉得您您刚刚讲的，我们要提到一个密密空密闭空间里面的循环，在宇宙也许是很重要的事情。对啊，谢谢谢谢谢谢，谢谢谢谢对啊，这是一个假设，没问题。谢谢陈老师，我也从你这边学到不少东西。对啊，好，另外一个最后一点就是，我现在一直在跟学生讲说，<笑>呃，我们我我们我并不是很排排斥 CO2 的排放，现在在日本 CO2 是一个资源，嗯、所以等于是大家在开始抢 CO2 当做资源在用。对啊，可能可能开始，我一直在跟台湾学生讲很多这样的概念、嗯，但是现在台湾的学生可能都还不太理解 CO2 是一个资源，而不是一个废物嘛。对啊，嗯，对啊，如果 CO2 能够变成资源，相信以后这个这个碳排的问题就就会被解决，这就是一个循环经济的概念。如果我们有一个 drive， 我们可能就会去想出我们怎么可以好好的利用本来我们觉得没有用，或者是甚至是有害的东西。对啊,嗯、对啊，那个叶老叶叶叶老老师是我们的天文专家。然后叶老师，你要不要跟我们说一下这个刚刚提到这个太空的问题？我看您有做了一个小小的说明，您要不要叶老师直接跟我们说说
很简短的说一下。呃，这这因为唐老师刚才说是从地从那个地球上运水到月球上是不是的？这重要问题是在在月球那边去把把水找出来呀，再做利用呀。对，那就变成是在月球上面的 cycle， 把它就是等于是在利用那里的 water cycle。嗯嗯嗯，对的，一样，嗯。好，呃，谢谢。虽然我们那个聊天室还有更多的问题谢谢哈，那但是我想我们已经十点半了，<笑>呃，或许因为今天的议题啊，非除了是科学之外，其实跟我们的生活也息息相关，所以我们讨论了很多科普跟。不仅仅是科普，还有很多专业的问题啊。那所以我，我我觉得对于这样的一个问题，我们其实下个月呢也有相关的议题。我欢迎我们的那个听众呢，就在下个月再回来。那我们可以讨论更多。呃，像其实今天聊天版还有最后一个问题是关于焚化炉的这些问题。其实下个月下个月呢，可能也可以再回答哈。那这个今天唐教授在讲座里面呢、啊。其实不仅仅是跟我们说科学，其实还提醒我们要做一些行动方案。那我们都是一个小市民，不过我们可以共同的来进行 recycle、reuse 跟 recover 这些事情。好，那呃，也希望透过这样子的科普活动呢，去邀请我们年轻的视野。哈，我们今天有很多年轻人，呃，很多高中生来参加。那我们也希望这些年轻的心智可以一起来加入这样的一个科学的研究。那我们今天的讲座呢，让我们带着问题跟责任回家哈，不是只是来听听，我们有好多责任。那地球给我们很多精彩丰富的生命，那我们也相对的应该更爱护跟回馈我们的地球。那因为时间的关系呢，我们今天的讲座必须到这边先告一个段落。那也谢谢唐老师为我们下个月的讲座做一个很好的铺陈哈。那最后呢，要再次谢谢唐教授今天为我们带来精彩的演讲。那我们上了非常宝贵的一课，那谢谢唐老师、嗯，也谢谢各位听众。那希望我们下个月可以线上再见。嗯嗯拜拜，谢谢大家给我这个机会，谢谢，谢谢拜拜，谢谢。谢谢